Hey gang, thank you for joining me again today. My name's Dan. Let's see if I can get this different fountain pen. I've done not extensive, but a reasonable amount of uh, research experimentation, I should say, with uh, various brands of fountain pens without getting crazy expensive, and they can get crazy expensive. I've never done any of those. This is a Lamy, L-A-M-Y, Lamy brand of Germany, I believe. And our impression is if it's made in Germany, it should be very high quality. Is that your impression? That's my impression. <laughs> I say that right before I say, but I've, I've never had quite the success. Okay, never, never mind. Now, no doubt it's my fault that this pin is clogged because it just needs some, excuse me, scratching your nose, needs some serious cleaning. It's a wonderful pen. But uh, the pen I am using today is pen and ink. It's called Pen and Ink Sketch. Creative name. <laughs> Distributed by Gary's Artorama, which is the company I use the most because they are in my hometown. So. Well, hello. Let's get official. This my name's Dan. Again, and this is a daily out adventure. Remember, can I say that right? Can you read that? I don't know. Nine hundred ninety-six. Woohoo! Pen and ink. And let's let's get you so you can see what I'm working on. Again, sorry about the bars that you see. That's the strobe effect uh, from the fluorescent light bulbs that are inside my light table. So let me give you a little run up. Then, <clears throat> if you saw my last broadcast, well, I can turn this off temporarily, can I? Uh, this was my first sketch. I think this was my second, sorry, third, fourth. Well, be that as it may, I, this was number five. This was number six. And on this one, I created some physical vanishing points, taped them down to my table. And this is sketch number six. Then I scanned that into my computer. And in Photoshop, I modified it in several little ways. So the, the image you can you can barely see. Can you see it? The image you, yeah, you can see it. All right. So that's print out from my computer, and it's essentially <coughs> sketch number six. All right. So again, just to give you a, a sense of what does an artist have to go through. Uh, the answer is one of the answers is five rough sketches, and I have two renderings that I'm working on. This is one, this the other. I'm not going to try to finish either one in this broadcast. That would be way too long. But I can, I can make some progress. And uh, I'm drawing on just a Strathmore drawing paper. Let me show you what brand it is. 400 series, the green one. And again, the pen I'm using, to start out with using two pens, really. Um, Pen and Ink Sketch is the brand name with black India ink, permanent waterproof black India ink in it. And then a felt tip pen made by, I can't remember. <laughs> it's, it's worn off. The lettering's worn off. <laughs> anyway, um, and just about ready to start. As you can see, brand new white paper. Happiness is white paper. And where does one begin a pen and ink drawing? Let me grab a piece of rough of scrap paper and answer that question because I I addressed this a couple weeks ago in a, a class that I was teaching. Um, 
that I was doing on watercolor painting and some of my students responded happily to this little bit of teaching because they'd never heard it described this way. So I'm going to start by describing traditional oil painting or acrylic painting. The, the key concept here is that oil and acrylics are generally considered to be opaque mediums. And I know you English majors, never mind. <laughs> In the art world, <laughs> I use the word plural as mediums. All right. If you're doing a traditional, not, not if you're painting like me, Dan Nelson, I paint weird, but if you're painting in a traditional oil acrylic opaque, you paint the sky first. In other words, the furthest away, the landscape. Let's, I'm just doing landscape. You start with the furthest away thing, sky. Then you do the next far away thing, which is so one sky, two mountains, because they're next furthest away compared to the sky. Then you paint <laughs> three hills. Then number four, you paint trees. As you can tell, this is a lovely painting. <laughs> number four, tree. Now, if you're not seeing the pattern, let me stop right here and explain it to you. With traditional opaque mediums like oil and acrylic, you start by painting the furthest away object, the sky, then the thing in front of that, the mountains, in front of that, the hills, in front of that, the trees, in front of that, the barn, in front of the barn, you put the horse, or the cow, I'm running out of room here, in front of the, in front of the cow, make it a cow, here's some horns, in front of the cow, you put the fence, in front of the fence, you put the weeds. That's traditional. These are little weeds, by the way. Okay. That's the traditional opaque approach to painting. You start far away and work forward. Now, conversely, in contrast to that, when you do, when you're doing any transparent, and I'll underline it since I underline that one, Transparent mediums, such as watercolor and, get this, believe it or not, pen and ink is a transparent medium. Now, I'm afraid I've lost some of you right there. What do you mean ink's transparent? Yep, ink is transparent. If you are drawing... Um, now I'm trying to think of a silly example something up close if you're drawing flowers in a vase you draw the in this pen and ink now you, okay two I said flowers so let's make them two okay a little bit of baby's breath in there and the stems come down and then you draw the clay vase in which they're sitting so this is going to be i'm sorry this is going to be confusing because now y'all are going to think this is a glass vase oh boy i picked a bad example okay look you can still see the stems <laughs> again <laughs> sorry i didn't i didn't plan it this ahead because now it's just like a glass vase now let's try to pretend this is opaque <laughs> okay oh i know let's let's switch it to a copper or brass cylindrical plant holder okay look it doesn't work why because you can still see the stems through the vase pen and ink even sharpie marker is a transparent medium okay so with okay I'm, i hope i've caught you all up with transparent mediums such as watercolor or pen and ink it's exactly 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 the opposite of this with transparent mediums you have to do the weeds first. 
And then you have to paint around the weeds to paint the fence. You can't paint the fence on top of the weeds. You have to go around, see? Is this making sense? And then you paint the cow behind, be, ooh, Texas Longhorn now. You paint the cow behind the fence, then you paint the barn behind the cow. Does this make sense? And then you paint the trees behind the barn, and then you paint the hills behind the trees, and then you paint the mountains behind the hills, and then you paint the sky last of all. Get it? With opaque mediums, you paint from the back forward. With transparent mediums such as watercolor and pen and ink, you start with the frontmost object and you work your way back, or you're gonna run into trouble. All right, so wasn't that exciting? I hope it was. Somebody out there needed to hear that. There we go. <laughs> so in this particular, quite a bit more boring, um, architectural rendering, where do I start? Do I start back here with, when? and this is a pretty detailed sketch. I mean, rough sketch is already there, but no, even so. For instance, I'm going to put a bush, and I didn't do a sketch of a bush, right here in the foreground. So guess what? Before I do any of this, the very first thing I want to do is a bush. All right, now let's talk about one way, the Dan Nelson way to render quickly and believably foliage. Okay, now you, I started down here in the lower left corner of this bush. It's going to be a general roundish bush. And I'm, I'm making a bunch of random scripts, trying to do random, going this way. Once I've gone around this way, then I turn around and go back the other direction doing lines inside and outside of the lines already. So I went around this way one time and back around this way one time. And then I do a few little leaves and stems and who knows what little bits, dots and circles, things that have escaped outside the boundary that I drew. And then I likewise come back on the inside and do, you could call them tree holes, if you will, but I do and if there's any shading at all, I'll do a little bit down here, right? So that's, you see, our, our brain has a hard time doing randomness. So that's why I go right around one time. You could say, well, couldn't you just go the same way twice? The answer is absolutely not. No, 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 no. I'm gonna make my hand go around this way one time, and then the opposite way, I'm gonna make different kinds of marks because my hand is marching, so to speak, in the opposite. You can go either way first, doesn't matter. But uh, just for what it's worth, that's a real quick little way to um, indicate uh, foliage. Now, I'm going to indicate a grass. And I actually talked about this in my last broadcast. So here I am for the second time today doing the edge of grass. In other words, in here, in this area in here, is mulch, we call it, in central North Carolina. It could be... Um, Let's see, I think I'll do one more bush, even though I wasn't told by my client to do more than one bush. It just seems to me to make sense. Um, these bushes are not part of the job that he's pitching, but hopefully the client will see my drawing and go, oh yeah, we want bushes just like that. <laughs> okay, so there, did you see I went around one time, one direction, came back, went the other way. Now I'm doing dots, out, dot, little dots and circles outside and little squiggles and dots and circles inside then a little bit of shadow down here this by the way is probably not going to be a crosshatched uh, pen ink rendering probably there may be maybe we don't know yet there may be a tiny bit of cross hatching or hatching without the cross without going both ways oh heck I'm gonna do another bush <laughs> I'm making this up as we go Same form. Did you catch that? Back it up and watch me do it again, just in case you missed it. And then in here is, is again, what we call mulch, either pine bark or wood chips or uh, pine straw, they call it in North Carolina, which means pine needles or uh, chopped up car tires. 
<laughs> I don't know if they have chopped up car tires for where you live, but they do here. Uh, often uh, stained to, to, to be red, to look, look like a, a natural product. That's actually a very, it's more expensive, of course, but it's a very clever use of car tires, and it's a very good uh, ground cover because, of course, it's, it's sort of heavy, doesn't blow away, and it doesn't rot, so it doesn't attract uh, termites, which the wood chips can, of course, do. All right, now let's talk about, so far everything's been organic, right? And you can see, I because pen and ink is a transparent medium, I started with the very frontmost objects, grass, mulch, bushes, and I'm going to work that way. Now, one of the decisions I need to make early, besides which tool to use, I've already made that decision, is how precise do I want this rendering to be? And there are times, I have a range myself as a, when I do architectural renderings, I have a range from extremely, extremely tight and accurate over here where every single brick is drawn all the way over to where it's quite, quite loose. Okay, and I think I want this rendering to be right about there, quite loose. That means I'm not going to use a ruler. I used a ruler. Let me show you the, my, my last sketch here again. I used a ruler quite, quite extensively uh, to do this rendering. Uh, but I'm not going to do that in the final. The reason, here's the, here's the rule, if you will. Once you start with a ruler for straight lines, you pretty much have to use a straight edge throughout the entire drawing. Whereas if you start out, this is going to be looser than that. This is going to be what I call a hand-drawn rendering. That means it's more loose, more wiggles, natural, natural looseness in the drawing. All right, so that decision has been made. Let's get started then. Again, once again, I'm working from the front to the back. And I did not bother to draw every every single uh, mark and every single line that needs to be drawn in this rendering. So I'm there are a number of things here in this rendering that I'm going to have to, to uh, invent or make up because I didn't I didn't um, finish them completely. in my rough sketch. All right, am I zoomed in far enough here for you guys? I think so. I want you to be able to see now some of, this is what I call hand-drawn technique. And I'll, I'm gonna grab a piece of scrap paper and describe this for you in just a minute. Let me do just a little bit more. But first of all, I'm hoping that you're noticing that I'm not drawing very perfect lines. And that is very much on purpose. All right, let me stop right there. And get that closer to you for just a second. All right, did you see that pretty well? Yeah? Okay. Let's do another quick sidebar lecture, if you will. That's a little bit of a serious, pretty serious word for what I'm doing, but it'll do. Let me see if I have scrap paper here. Don't want to use brand new stuff if I can help it. Yeah, here we go. All right. Oops. That's not, not clean. Let's try again. Here we go. All right. Oh, I've given this lecture so many times. But if you're new, it bears repeating. Hey, somebody saying hi. Hello, Mario Bros from Chile. Oh, thank you very much. Nice to have you on board. And Bud Dyer. Dwyer. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much, bud. Thanks for joining us today. And Mario from Chile. Fantastic. I love it. And Batman from somewhere in the Far East. Oh, my goodness. How fun. And from Brazil. Oh, my goodness. We're all over the, all over the world today. Not many viewers, but from all over. That is so fun. All right. Um, here's the foundational rule. 
If you are a human being, <laughs> then you are unable, essentially, S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, you are unable to draw straight lines. So I'm going to X through this, which means humans cannot draw straight lines without a ruler. I, or a straight edge, as some people like to call it. In fact, let me grab a let me grab a straight edge here. Okay, so here's a straight line with a ruler or a straight edge. Okay, human beings cannot draw straight lines, but we can draw. So that means the only kind we can draw is crooked. But we can draw two kind two categories of crooked lines either happy ones or grumpy ones, <laughs> okay? Two kinds of, of crooked lines. We can either draw nice looking crooked lines or we can draw ugly crooked lines. I'm gonna call these two categories attractive, attractive crooked. Do you understand? The only kind you can draw is crooked, unless you use a ruler. And then ugly crooked. Now, the easiest way for me to proceed at this point is actually to show you how to draw an ugly crooked line. And I'm going to do it right here on this piece of paper. Ready? That's ugly. Some of you are saying, why? I don't, I don't see what's wrong with it. Well, it might, I don't know if this will work or not. Let's, let's try it. Can you... Can you see if I hold this <laughs> right up against your camera? Can you see how crooked that is? Now do you see how crook how curved that is? Right? So is it straight? Is this a straight line? Yeah, I think it's working pretty well here. It's out of focus, but no, it curves. It is not as in fact it curves twice. It curves this way and then it curves this way. Whoa. So here's why this is ugly. This kind of line, it looks, and I'm not going to write all this, looks, it looks as if the artist tried, and here's, there's the mean word, it looks as if the artist tried to draw a straight line tried straight and failed <laughs> okay because it is not straight and you don't even have to you know you don't even have to do this to see that it's not straight I can you can easily see that it's not straight but it looks as though the artist tried to draw a straight line and failed this creates tension in the heart, mind, soul of the viewer. Okay, you put glasses on this guy. This is this is a person who's looking, <laughs> who's looking at your artwork, and he's unhappy. Be, he he or she can tell that I tried to draw a straight line and failed. Therefore, it makes him grumpy. You with me? So let's go back to my ugly crooked is try and fail equals grumpy. <laughs> T plus F equals G or grumpy or even angry. Okay. On the other hand, how do you draw a crooked line? Well, let me do that intentionally. Let me, not, 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 all I can draw is crooked. How do I draw attractive crooked? All right. The answer is this. There's one way to do it. Let me show you another way. There's another attractive crooked line. All of these lines are crooked. This line is also crooked. Do you understand? I showed you. But these lines are attractively crooked. How come? Now, are they are they actually straight? Well, they're actually closer than closer than this one. But no, they're attractive. <laughs> here's here's our guy with glasses on again, and he's all happy. Why? Because the viewer can tell that the artist 
intentionally drew crooked lines to give the impression of straight lines, but he, they're crooked, but the viewer can tell that I made them crooked on purpose. Therefore, the viewer is happy. Do you follow me? So the answer, how do you make attractive crooked lines? Because that's the only alternative open to you as a human being. And the answer is make them, all right, go back, turn off some lights here. The answer is make them intentionally crooked. And so you can see my, that my, my hand is, is jerking a little bit. Stuttering would be a good word. Uh, starting and stopping. Lifting up off the page, actually leaving little gaps. Let me zoom in so you can see that as much as possible. All those things indicate to the viewer, that's this viewer, right? The happy viewer. Indicate to the viewer that I'm making these lines crooked on purpose. And that is what makes him happy. Because he goes, oh, whew, the artist did those crooked lines on purpose. Huh? These aren't, and aren't they beautiful? Now, of course, that brings in the whole subject of, you know, the essence of good drawing, just like the essence of good painting is making interesting marks. So the essence of good drawing is making interesting marks. And you have to figure that out for yourself. What makes an interesting mark? So um, there we go. That's an important principle. By the way, you see me holding my, my pen in two different ways. Sometimes I'm using it, holding it, what I call side saddle, like this. And uh, hang on, let me see which way does this go. Um, I want to make this goes um, about like this. I'm going to get the angle just about right. And as you can see, I'm also, I'm also estimating you know, these are supposed to be one by four, one by four inch boards. This is just one of the techniques that my client uses uh, to, to fill in underneath a deck. Does that make sense? You know, one of the most common things to do here is, is lattice, it, you know, that looks like that. But we talked about it this morning and he decided, he said, yeah, I guess make it one by fours at an angle. And I've done a lot of work for this client, so I know what he means when he says one by four at an angle. And again, as you can see, I'm just, this is my fairly rough or abstract style of architectural rendering. I do, I do some architectural renderings that are much, much tighter than this. And I would use, I would use a ruler for every single line. So that style, of course, takes a lot more time and is considerably more expensive. My client has to pay more if that's the kind of um, illustration he wants. And, but I, I'm, I know that that is not what this, my client wants. This, I, we, I've done a lot of work for him, so he would not be happy if I did a super, super tight illustration and then handed him an invoice for two or three times the amount that he's accustomed to paying. Right. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to pause there again. I'm not going to do the, uh, the whole illustration. Now let's do the the railing. And again, are you making sense? I mean, there's a there's going to be something back here, a, a hot tub or jacuzzi. Uh, there's going to be a gas burning fire pit here with furniture and so forth. But there's going to be a, a railing in front of it. So because um, because pen and ink is a transparent medium, you work from the front back, which is, of course, exactly what you see me doing here.
and I'm using a, a fountain pen because a fountain pen has can create thick thick and thin lines more easily than a, a rapidograph pen. Here's, for instance, this is a rapidograph pen. Whoops. Can you can you see that? Yeah. Oh, oh, hang on, I'll get it there in a second. There we go. Okay, that's a, the workhorse of the graphic arts industry 30 years ago <laughs> was the rapidograph pen. And I still use them occasionally, but not nearly as often as I used to. Rapidograph is again is the name, the brand name of that kind of pen. Once again, you see me, I'm allowing my hand to make little wiggles and jiggles and picking up and leaving, leaving blanks, if you will, empty spaces. I'm going to switch grip right now. I would not trust myself um, to get all of these pickets vertical if I hadn't worked it out ahead of time in my rough sketch. I think they're I think they're pretty close, so I feel fairly comfortable. Once again, I'm just eyeballing it. I'm just guessing, estimating how far apart they all are. Let me see what else you guys are saying over here. <laughs> Grady, <laughs> a local in South Carolina. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. And Vanessa from Slovenia and Dan from, and, and I mean, P, Pink Maze, oh, wait, P. Maisie, P. Maisie from Kentucky. Hello, David from Canada. <laughs> and David, thanks for asking. And there's Pink Haze Pie. My goodness. Illustration day, how fun! Thank you, thank you, thank you for cheering. Yes, David, thanks for asking. I am, I uh, generally, I am loving my new calling. Although, as you can probably imagine, I'm going through a little bit of emotional. Is that the right word? It sounds too extreme, but a disequilibrium after after working so hard as an artist for 16 years. You know, a hundred miles an hour pedal to the metal all the time, all of a sudden I'm not doing that anymore. So yes, it, it feels strange sometimes. Today feels very normal to be sitting on my butt in my studio, <laughs> doing some drawings for a client with pressure on me. You know, it feels familiar, but uh, we're actually enjoying it quite a bit. Thank you very much. So I don't, the rest of you probably don't know what David is talking about. About two or three months ago, um, much to my surprise, I suddenly found myself going through a career change. Uh, I've been a full-time artist, as I said, for full full-time for 16 years. And all of a sudden now I'm a full-time, for want of a better word, I'll say pastor, as in church pastor, but the image that comes to mind with that is probably not quite not typical. My church, again, even that word, we don't, and we don't call it a church, but our gathering, our people meet in a parking lot, outdoors in a parking lot in the heart of downtown Raleigh, my hometown, Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, actually, I'm loving it. And also, I at, at our gatherings, at our meetings, um, I spend virtually the whole time, two hours, playing music. Um, so all of a sudden my my musical career is back to closer to center stage, which I'm enjoying very much. I play, well the joke is, this is not literal, but forgive me, this is the joke. I play 50 musical instruments. Well that's because when I'm set up to play, as like on Sunday mornings, I literally do have 50 instruments around me, but I don't, that's and I'll explain it why that is in a second. I don't literally play 50 different instruments. I play about five or six, 
and I'm working on a couple more. But I, I play I play trumpet, therefore I have two different a trumpet and a flugelhorn. I play guitar, therefore I have three, four, or five guitars around of all different style kinds around me, including a ukulele. Um, I uh, I'm playing through a whole phalanx of synthesizers and processors and so forth. So on my guitar, I can play electric bass or any kind of bass, and I can play, you know, piano and all kinds of other things while playing on my guitar. Anyway, and then I play, here's where it get the numbers come up. I play flutes and whistles. I play the flute and I play whistles. So I have about 20 whistles. I play harmonica, so I have about 20 harmonicas. And I'm working on French horn and, uh, I'll, and I play um, saxophone and I'm, Looking forward to getting a soprano sax very soon. Anyway, that's way more information than it, all y'all needed. But <laughs> and I have just started a new. A new uh, by the way, I'm using this to to get make sure this line is vertical. Um, what was I about to say? What was I about to say? You're about to say you have a new something. I have a new something. Well, it's not, uh, I play I play tenor sax, and I'm looking for buying, looking forward to buying a soprano. And I just started, just picked up French horn a couple of weeks ago, which I'm enjoying immensely. I have several siblings and cousins and nephews that play French horn. It sort of runs in our family. Anyway, so that's why I have 50 instruments around me. <laughs> but I have a, I love it. And I practice. I'm a practicing, a practicing musician. <laughs> well, Skylar from Hawaii, my goodness. And Grady Gillis. Retired second career in June from teaching. Ha <laughs> ha, Grady, talking about shifts in career, eh? Yeah. I can't imagine, well, I guess I can. What I've just gone through is a little bit like retirement. So I guess part of the story that may be not obvious, I don't know, is that, is that uh, much to our surprise, much to our shock and amazement, um, people in our gathering are are paying our bills like they're giving like offerings does that make sense so the big change is i i don't have to rely on my artwork to pay the mortgage so to speak again did not see this coming but i'm we're very very happy cutting edge might be a good word for the ministry we're involved with Oh, I know, and I—that's right. I was going to tell you that I, I have a new, um, new Google account where I'm—I am going to start uh, posting um, my teaching and my music, and it's my new account is Dan Nelson Teaching. This account that you're on right now is Dan Nelson Artist, and uh, or Dan Nelson Art, and and the new account is Dan Nelson teaching. So there you go. Teaching as not teaching art, but teaching spiritual stuff for one of a better term. Um, I think I might stop on that one and pull up this other illustration just so I can model some perhaps some different things. Let me turn off my light and the the table. And now you can't see. And this is a, a blob, by the way. The ink spilled, which is not a fun moment, but we'll we'll get over it. This rendering, this illustration right here, is going to be uh, 
rendered in color. So I will be adding watercolor to this one. So that puts slightly different, slight different uh, requirements, slightly different style on the illustration since three poplar trees back here. At the base. Of the, of the poplar trees is a, again, a natural, what we call natural area. So mulch, uh, pine straw, pine bark, wood chips, D, all of the above, whatever, and some large boulders, which this client likes to use as um, as landscape elements. People seem to like it very well. That we have some of his work in our backyard, and we we like our boulders. <laughs> And again, you, some of you may notice that uh, why is he holding his pen in that strange manner? The answer is because it's it keeps me out of my control freak side of my brain. This one, you hold your pen in this way, and, and I do indeed hold it this way for details. But um, I don't know how to say it. I'm just not quite as free when I hold the, the pen in that way. Okay, so it's a little bit hard to explain, I know. Okay, and then there's a, a fence, kind of a, kind of a fancy, maybe wrought iron looking fence way back here. But it's, pretty far away as you can see so I don't want to uh, hope my pen's acting up now okay here let's do this Let me turn off this light stick again so you can see what's going on so I'm taking the back off this pen there's a there's a reservoir here if I turn this the plunger goes down and pushes ink down through the the tip of the pen Up. Okay, there's my answer. There's why. Um, I am out of ink. Okay, so you guys get to watch a little bit of an awkward process of uh, how to refill this pen. Oh, it's about to get more awkward. Oh, here we go. All right. So this is the way I do it. This by no means saying this is the only way to do it, but let me show you since I'm going to use this little device. doesn't mean anything. It's, a, it's just a pen holder but or a brush holder. But I have here a nice little tiny glass bottle with a, a lid. Okay. And I'm just going to unscrew that lid and set this right there. So that just... <laughs> Again, you you figure this stuff out after a while. Does that make sense? <laughs> and um, and I want to see how much ink is already in there. Oh, very little. Okay, that's what I thought. So the ink I'm using is Black India Rapidograph ink. That's that same brand name I talked a while ago about the, the pen ink. So I'm going to unscrew the lid and squirt some into this little bottle. And then I take this plunger out of here. It, it, it. <laughs> oh, 
wipe it off, even though I'm about to make it dirty. Um, make sure that it's really empty. Yeah, it is. Okay, the plunger is all the way down. And let me, yes, if I screw it clockwise, it sucks ink. So I st stuck, stick this down into this bottle of ink and turn clockwise, and the plunger comes up. Now this, this little barrel here, this reservoir is full of ink. Then I put it back, fits nice and snug over a little pin, a, a point, a reed sticking up there. And then if I turn it counterclockwise, now I can, there we go. So I just saw a drop of ink go down into the, into the point. Let me set that right there and put, so the ink that's left in here is still good. That's part of the reason why I keep this little bottle right here so that it's ready to go next time and I can go ahead and put the as soon as I find it I can put the, <laughs> the barrel back on the uh, on the pin oh and that's oh, here it is okay all right so barrel back on now, I'm not ready to draw yet not by any means because it's too great a danger of dropping so I, I test it several times. I, I'll, I'll, I post-it notes on my on my drawing table like this is standard operating procedure by the way since I'm going to this degree sometimes you can get a, a fountain pen to work I have a bottle of water way up there no you can't see it but anyway it's just a bottle of water I use it for my watercolor brushes and so forth right and I just dipped this nib. That just helps keep ink from getting caked up on it too much. Now, now once again, yeah, of course, it's in danger of blobbing, dropping. But it seems to be doing all right. There you go. Does that make sense? So I'm going to, again, keep this. I use this throughout the drawing process to make sure that my uh, pen is functioning well. All right, there you go. So now back to drawing just for a few more minutes. I'm not gonna make this drag on this broadcast too long. Once again, I'm making the, the, the staves or the spindles, if you will, the pickets in this black wrought iron fence making the lines a little bit irregular for the same reason that I stated earlier about it. A human being is incapable of drawing a perfect straight line. So if I were to try to make these perfect, I would miss the mark and it would irritate the viewer. So it's better to do it a little bit intentionally uh, hit and miss, crooked, and so far artsy, right? <laughs> Most people maybe would call this kind of artsy. Little dots and dashes. Of a... Now, let's, let's do just a little bit more. I have another area up here where this is basically trees in the background. N not really a part of the, uh, the landscape job. This, these are trees that exist already in the area. So I'm just going to indicate a uh, random tree line, but I, I'm going to employ the trick that I've mentioned many times. So I just went from left to right. Now I'm going to turn around, go the opposite direction. By the way, I don't know if you can see how very, very lightly the, the I'm letting just really just the weight of the pen, not pushing down at all. But now I'm going from left to right, as you can see, and making my, my lines, my chaotic outline lines, go across the first line. And then come back and do just a few dots, circles, outside. The idea, of course, is to try to create what looks like a natural or chaotic or random. And then inside, a little bit larger, suggesting perhaps what are traditionally called sky holes. And of course, a few 
hints of tree trunks. Again, I want this to look like, I can turn this, I want this to look like a bank of trees. I, I want it to be pretty much ignored by the viewer. I, I don't want the, the viewer to, to focus on, ooh, look at those trees, right? That would be counterproductive. It, it just, uh, and if I were to do some cross hatching, it may very well be, let me think, let me think. Hang on, I am thinking here. Because if I do any cross hatching or hatching, where there's no crossing, but just hatching, which is even more likely. I, I, one of the places would be up there. Oh, sure. Let, let's do it just for fun. <laughs> and I am going to do um, watercolor on this one. So the lines I'm doing right now, I don't really need to do them for realism's sake. It's really just for artistic sake, just to make the, the rendering fun to look at, if you will. And this is a trick that I employ very often. And you, you'll notice, first of all, I turned the, the illustration up on end so that I can allow my hand to make the most natural hatch marks, which, of course, is straight down, right? Drawing, drawing the, the point of the pen toward me. Oh, and here's another little trick. If you do... If you do um, hatching, again, cross hatching would be if I come back and make lines go the other way, but I'm not going to do that. So it's just called hatching. But, and I'm leaving gaps between the passes. And look at this, I'm doing some little bits of cross, of not cross, little bits of hatching outside. Let's do some up here. Outside the boundary, if you will, of the window of the trees <laughs> outside the window outside the trees so the idea is once i've finished a little bit of hatching that these trees in the distance and part of the reason i'm not doing cross hatching by the way it would make them too dark first of all plus it would just be too textured it would draw too much attention i want these trees in the background to appear somewhat flat and so i don't want them coming toward the viewer um it, it, it really at all so by just doing hatching in one direction it will they will end up so so to speak laying flat on the paper and not coming toward the viewer and this allows me to create just a little bit of abstract realism to these distant trees without going overboard. Again, some of the hatching I actually do outside the outline of the trees. Fair enough. I think I'll let it go with that. Now, having done some hatching there, that means I probably should do hatching somewhere else. And I've just made a determination that the light in this illustration is coming from our left. So that means this little fire pit right here, which is rounded, will be shaded on the right side because the light's coming from the left. And here's the, the hole inside the fire pit. Get it? Same thing over here. I probably will not do any cross hatching per se. In this illustration that would be it would be too busy i think for a, an illustration for a rendering uh this simple most of if i'm only doing hatching as opposed to cross hatching just for what it's worth most of the time if i'm doing hatching it will actually be at an angle the way i did on these boulders let's do this, another one up here again i'm keenly aware now of the fact that the light the sunlight is coming from our left, so I'm doing the shading on the right side of these boulders. Um, but all of this hatching is at an angle about like that. Uh, it, uh, in my big cross-hatching video that some of you probably have seen, many of you, that's how you found me. Um, let me, if, 
first of all, admit that there are a dozen different ways to do cross hatching or shading with pen and ink. And um, I'm by no means suggesting that my way is the only way or even that my way is the best way. Um, it is, however, my native style. Uh, many people have said, well, my teacher said, or, you know, so-and-so. <laughs> they said it with that tone of voice, too, I promise. That, that shading, uh, cross-hatching or hatching should be done with organic, curved, you know, expressive lines. And, in fact, I do that sometimes. And I honor and understand that style of uh, hatching or cross-hatching. Um, but my style is just a little bit more abstract. I, 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 I know that, and I, I own that, I admit that freely. Uh, in other words, it, it's rather regimented that other than these trees back here, which are, the, the hatching is going this way, almost other, all the other hatching is going at an, the same angle. Pointing, by the way, at the light source. I might point that out, but that's all right. I don't even need to point that out. Um, it is a rather OCD, can I use that word? Obsessive compulsive. I try to draw the line at disorder, <laughs> but I am a fairly obsessive compulsive personality. You can tell by the way that I make these straight lines all pretty uniform, right? Same distance apart, blah, blah, blah. That's a clear indication of a obsessive compulsive personality. As I said, I try to draw the line somewhere, you know, south of disorder. <laughs> and my wife is very happily married to me and I think she would agree that I'm I'm not OCD. I'm just I'm just an orderly kind of person. And you could see that. Um, I have run into people in my life who are who do artists who are so much more uh, stiff than I am. It makes me look like a wild and crazy artist, which is pretty funny because I'm so stiff compared to many and yet there I know several that make me look like I'm a loose, loose wild man because <laughs> their lines are straighter than mine. Isn't that funny? Um, now the question still does remain, am I going to do any hatching on this and this one is going to remain black and white so I'm pretty sure that yes I'm actually I am I'm gonna go ahead and do start some right now so this is one of the bushes in the foreground therefore again I'm going with my typical approach of if I'm only doing one layer, and I prob it's, I will probably, again, only do one layer of shading on this particular illustration. If I go into cross-hatching, that is making two layers, um, the drawing becomes quite a bit more representational, realistic. Of course, all quote-unquote realistic within the bounds of pen and ink, right? And more finished, and that is that's just not what this client is after like that's that's good enough right there to indicate shading and then of course I'll do some shadow underneath the bush all right now I'm doing some scribble hatching which is even a looser which is a looser form of shading where my pen is drawing going both directions Fair enough. I don't know if there's anything else I need to show you. Sure, a little bit. So the foreground of this illustration is just a green lawn, green grass. Uh, this stuff is in the background, it's coming forward. So one of the primary tricks, quote unquote, tricks to indicate depth in a landscape, of course, is horizontal lines. So I ha I've already sketched in real quickly lines in the grass and then 
these marks indicate uh, shading in the grass. So it, it's as if there's a shadow of something, or it could just be a bad patch, <laughs> a patch of weeds in the grass. Doesn't matter, right? Really doesn't matter. Um, or a patch of nice grass. <laughs> Um, but I'll show you. And one of the things I'm indicating as well is that in the middle ground, back here, I guess middle background, my cross hatching was going in this direction. Shadow of a chair, shadow of the table and chair and umbrella. All right. I, I will not make some of my cross hatching or sh hatching go in the in the mid zone in the mid area won't make some this way and some this way and that would be more realistic perhaps but that's not what i'm after that would not serve my purposes or nor my clients um i wanted to i want to keep it simpler than that so all the shading back here is going to go this way but here in the foreground i'm switching direction of the cross hatching and it's all it's a different style as you can see the cross hatching here is much coarser lighter the lines are further apart and the lines are a little looser they're a little bit more crooked than these back here these are pretty tight and pretty straight why am i making these looser because i'm trying to suggest shadows in the grass and shadows on grass are not perfectly tight in fact Bear with me, not bear with me, watch, hang on for another one. I'm going to do another horizontal striation, another horizontal row, another horizontal line in the landscape by doing a bit of hatching that's not, it's not bounded by this kind of line. Does that make sense? A little bit more. And again, this this uh, rendering is going to be finished in watercolor. So all of this hatching will be subsumed, covered up somewhat, a little bit, um, with the watercolor. The watercolor will agree, like that I will do darker green here in this shadow and lighter green where I don't have any cross hatching. There's a little very important tree right here. shadow of a tree this is a little pond so yes by all means let's do um, a little bit of shading or hatching indicating reflections horizontal reflections in the water again horizontal lines in a landscape suggest depth so that's why the primary reason why these are here again I will not be doing cross hatching because that would get us in, in trouble. That would get us into, of course, it'll take more time too. And this is a, a pretty low budget, quick in and out illustration. I've done a lot of work for this client. I pretty much know what he wants. And he doesn't want the Mona Lisa and he doesn't want to pay thousands of dollars for it, <laughs> to say the least. And so just hatching going one direction is more than adequate. Again, back to the very background there's a trick, I guess I should explain this, why, and this is very typical for me, by the way, why does the, sh the hatching in the, f in the far distance, why is it horizontal? And in the intermediate ground, it's at an angle because the angle hatching has a higher energy, visual energy than the horizontal. The horizontal is peaceful because horizontal lines are peaceful vertical second most peaceful angle most energetic so the, the i'm adding energy to the middle ground but back here i want it i want the to feel like these trees are back 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 therefore 
horizontal lines. It would not be the same. It would be a mistake in my world to do these at an angle. That would make them too busy and attract too much attention. It would be a mistake even to do them vertical. So again, this is a habit I've had for decades and it still feels right to me, still makes sense. So I, if you go to my, look at my architectural renderings, go to dannelsonart.com, click on illustrations, click on architectural renderings, you'll see a range of uh, some, some that are very realistic. As I said earlier, every brick is drawn with a ruler and then others that are quite loose. But you'll notice this, this particular trick I use extensively distant foliage, distant trees, distant hills, even sometimes the sky uh, only has horizontal hatching because it's the most peaceful. Therefore, whatever's far away is encouraged to stay far away. Right? I think I might stop there. Let me take a look again at the other. So I've got two illustrations I'm working on at the same time. And I think you've seen a fair representation of my approach to penning. Now, again, here I'm opening this pen. I don't start drawing with it. I go up here to these a little stack of post-it notes to make sure it's functioning well. You do the same thing with uh, Rapidograph pens, you do the same thing with airbrush. You always give it a, a little test run before you before you hit your drawing or painting. And as you see, I'm using the traditional death control grip. <laughs> Just me being a little bit exaggerating there. It's not really death control, but that the control grip because this to me feels like the, the appropriate moment for this kind of control. And back here inside on the on the deck is a gas fire pit. So yes, I'm going to, do you see I just changed grips to render flames, right? Because flames are loose. So I don't want to be using a, a tight, tight, tight grip to try to give the impression of flames. I wanted to go ahead and do this because I want to see how is it going to look when I'm trying to draw. Yeah, that, that'll work. You see, you can see it through the through the railings, right? We add a little bit more uh, hardware to the fireplace back there. Oh, and then of course some some dots. You know. Just again, give the impression of fire. I'll finish this segment of staves or pickets or whatever you want to call them. By the way, these um, these pickets have a little twist to them. This, the, each of these sections is made out of aluminum. So I probably will come in here. In this case, these little lines that I'm making are not suggestive of shading. It's not cross-hatching. I'm actually trying to indicate the, the twist that, that does exist. And I think the client will probably notice that. Let's, let's turn the backlight off so you can see. Yeah. Yeah. And that means that my client doesn't have to explain to his client. He, does, he doesn't have to say, oh, these are the the ra same kind of railings you already have on your porch. It'll save him some words because the client who already has this on his porch, he'll be able to look at that and say, oh, that's like I have on my porch, right? So that's my job is to try to aid and I'll do more of that later on. But that's enough for right now.
let's do a little bit more shading on this bush and maybe then I'll quit. I see a number of chats, you guys. I, I appreciate your uh, joining me for this conversation. I appreciate it. We have people all over the world. My goodness. Germany, Brazil, South Carolina, <laughs> Canada. <laughs> I'm kidding about the South. Anyway, never mind. Thank you for joining me from South Carolina. <laughs> not, not, not too far from, from where I live. <laughs> All right. Tell you what. Let me uh, change your view once again so I think you can see me. Let's work on it. <laughs> Hang on. There we go. And let me see what else you guys are saying. <laughs> Uncle 60, bless your heart. Uncle 60 just sent $50 uh, on t PayPal for turkey and beer. <laughs> you know what? I actually cook beer with my turkey. Um, it's my job to cook turkeys at our house. Um, for the last five or six years, I do a trash can turkey. Any of you guys ever heard of a trash? It sounds terrible, doesn't it? It's fantastic. And plus, save, saves my wife all the headache of cooking a turkey because I cook it in the backyard under a trash can, a clean trash can. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Lots of, oh, from Maui, Hawaii. Oh my goodness. Uh, I am almost, Wanda, I'm almost to 1,000. Isn't that something? <laughs> Uncle, it's nothing like tooting my own horn. Exactly. I've done a lot of that lately. Am I giving? No, 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 no. I'm not giving up art. No, 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 no. That would be a travesty. Um, I'm looking, this will be an interesting season. The difference is for the last 16 years, I've paid all my bills by selling artwork. So I have worked like a maniac. The difference now is somebody else is paying our bills through offerings, tithes and offerings to those, those of you who know those words. And uh, much to our surprise, I mean, we're just, we're just flat. And my wife and I are still kicking each other. Like, can you believe this? Now we love it. Don't get me wrong. I'm, you know, but uh, no. So what it means is I can do other than assignments, which I have several on board right now. Um, I can paint what I want. And I'm kind of looking forward to that. Um, uh, I continue, I, I expect to continue to work quite hard on my artwork, but it won't be with the same frequency. As you can see, my broadcasts are considerably less frequent. Um, but I hope that the freedom I feel will result in some better artwork. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, <laughs> Uncle said the ink blob is a squirrel's nest. <laughs> Happy, happy accident. Exactly. <laughs> Xanthan gum, do do it yourself medium on my watercolor. Hey, goopy and spreads the paint and dries away in about four hours. No kidding. Xanthan gum, do it yourself medium on your watercolor. Very interesting. Thank you very much. And use ink to, to stain color. Got it. I've done, I mean, to stain wood. I've done that. It's good. <laughs> thank you uncle you're too kind i appreciate it truly very much thank you thank you thank you thank you oh i'm sorry mr boss that your internet is too bad that you can't see well i'm sorry about that and angela thank you for your encouraging words how often do i stream well it used to be almost every day for three over three years it was over five times a week uh, but I'm falling back from that now. It probably averaged twice a week, I would think, in the last couple of months. So sorry about that. That's just like. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. Yes, Michael McEwen, Pastor Dan. <laughs> My friends, the people who attend our gathering, call me that. <laughs> and then laugh. <laughs> These are my friends, I promise. <laughs> Because they know, they say, no, I'll, I'll chafe just a little bit. Partly because uh, 
pastoral is not my primary gifting. I am a teacher, and and I am a number of other things, but that pastor is it's not my primary gift. So that's why they call me that and laugh. You guys are probably hearing my some of this echo, aren't you? Sorry about that. I know there's a down volume here somewhere. There we go. All right, been great fun. Thank you again, all you guys, for watching. I appreciate it. And if I start doing something exciting, I'll broadcast again. Thanks for watching. Happy Thanksgiving, if I don't see you all between now and then. And the rest of you, happy November 25th, or whatever it is, <laughs> 26th. <laughs> in, in the States, it's called Thanksgiving. And it's a good day. Give thanks. That's